So before we move on, we would like you to take a look at this. Hi, Crystal. How are you? You have won the 2020 Cisco Youth Leadership Award. Congratulations. Hi. So that was Crystal Quizera, the founder of the NGO Water Access Rwanda, finding out uh, that she's been awarded the Cisco Youth Leadership Award at this year's Global Citizen Prize Awards. Now, the prize was set up in 2018 to honour young people who've dedicated themselves to working towards UN goals, uh, in this case of providing African communities with clean water. Her NGO is a social enterprise that supplies over 70,000 people in Rwanda with clean water on a daily basis. Now, throughout the lockdown, Crystal has made sure Water Access Rwanda has continued to operate, giving away free water to those who've become unemployed so they wouldn't lose access or be forced to return to old and sanitary ways of collecting water. I was looking at news online and I found that a crocodile had killed people in eastern districts of Rwanda. At the time I was studying in Oklahoma, and I was invited by the former president of my university to design a project because we had an opportunity to raise $60,000 for a summer project. So we raised, actually ended up raising $75,000 to drill 13 boreholes so that our communities living those crocodile infested lakes no longer had to face death in order to access water. We drilled 13 boreholes that summer and by the end of it, my life was completely transformed. My name is Christelle Quizera. I'm the founder and managing director of Water Access Rwanda. I started Water Access Rwanda in 2014 to address two main issues on the African continent, youth unemployment and the water crisis. We have a very, very simple mission to use young people as solution providers in the water sector. Some of those solutions include our STAR project Inuma, which is the first ever rural water safe water mini grid. We have Amazi, which is focused on rainwater harvesting, Uhira, which is focused on farmers and their need to irrigate, and its little sister called Ijabo, which will provide mini grids for farmers who don't own that much land to be able to irrigate. We do everything in house, from drilling to surveying locations to installing the pumps and filters. We have a full technical team ready to deploy all these different solutions to address economic water scarcity. Water is also a sector holding much opportunity. When you look at the current number of young people in Africa without employment, and then you look at the potential to create jobs if we invest in more water infrastructures, we can actually create a bunch of jobs for young people. Technology plays a huge role. It has to be simple and it has to be something that you just forget about. You know, most people don't even realize how water reaches their homes. We want our technology to be so simple and so reliable that people never ever have to worry about how the water actually reaches them. I think winning the Cisco Youth Leadership Award will bring much impact to our social enterprise and also the millions of people we are going to impact in the next 10 years to come. But also most of it will go directly to bringing clean drinking water to people. We estimate over 15,000 people will receive access to a piped water connection into their homes that their children can inherit and which will guarantee generations of people in those communities will have access to water and no longer have to worry about clean drinking water again. Clean accessible water available inside the home is now a top agenda item for many people who previously did not necessarily think that you needed more than just a hand pump in a rural community. So now we can challenge that. It is also a challenge for us young people now and a personal challenge to me to continue liberating the Rwandan people, the African people from poverty. You see how pumping takes too much strength. So that is what I work for every day.
many millions, hundreds of millions of Africans don't have access to clean water. And many of them, even if they have access, it is not in a convenient way. So I started my company, Water Access Rwanda, in 2014 to address two big issues I saw uh, within the African continent. Those being youth unemployment and water scarcity. So we have a very simple mission, use young people as solution providers in the water sector. And it took us a few years, but in 2017, we launched a water mini grid that we call Inuma. So Inuma will go to those same boreholes, usually broken, pipe the water out and then filter that water so that it's safe to drink, safe for storage. And then we pipe that water in people's homes using prepaid meters. It's convenient and it is cheap. Every liter we sell of safe to drink, ready to use water is only $0.001. When I first heard of the African Entrepreneur Prize, I knew I was the kind of dreamer they were looking for. A person who's used business, used technology to solve a pressing need on the continent. This is a competition that is very Pan-African in nature to see the African entrepreneurs who are bringing solution and revolutionizing Africa as we know it. So I lost the last round, uh, which is not a bad loss because I got a hundred thousand dollars and that money has been helpful. We were able to increase inventory, we were able to buy machines we never dreamed we would be able to buy before. So beyond the money, you will get amazing advice, amazing exposure, amazing networks that will pay off for your business for years to come. So guys, this is the time for you, this is the time for Africa. It's all about you and the work you have already been doing. So you are a hero, maybe you just don't have the title yet. If you are providing a solution to problems you know are in your community, you have been living for this dream and struggling, trying to make ends meet from any way, this is the time for you, so make sure you apply. My name is Christelle Kuzera. I'm the Founder and Managing Director of Water Access Rwanda. It's a GIU alumni from 2015 and I'm from Kigali, Rwanda. As a child, I visited my grandmother a lot and my grandmother lives in Buriga district, which is a very mountainous part of Rwanda. And it was just part of everyday routine to wake up and go look for water down in the valley. I do remember that already at a very young age, unclean water, lack of access was playing a role. And as I started researching the water crisis, I found that it was very widespread across the world with over 2 billion people worldwide not having easy access to water. And it's an issue that calls for quickly scalable solutions that can really meet the need because we've been tackling the water crisis for so many years. The mission of Water Access Rwanda is to solve the water crisis and create employment for young people. We also want to provide water in a convenient way. Women currently are spending 200 million hours on a daily basis collectively together working and finding water. That's just in Sub-Saharan Africa. For the last six years, I've woken up every day to work on this dream that we can provide access to water in a sustainable and scalable way, improve people's lives. College for me was a time to come up with solutions to things I saw in the world that need fixing. And CGI was just the place to be because it was the place for student activism, being part of a community of like-minded individuals who are you know, introducing change in the world. And it's a source of encouragement and support for me. The world is still facing some grand challenges, challenges that are way bigger than one individual or even one country. Grand challenges need grand solutions, grand collaboration because we work so much better when we work together. We need all hands on deck. Hello, wonderful peoples. Welcome back to uh, Theo is Back. So today I have a very interesting interview. I'm actually honored to be interviewing this uh, young entrepreneur. We're going to meet her in a second. Um, thank you all for my lovely Patreons, anyone who's supporting this channel. Um, if you have any questions for my guest, you can post them in the comments uh, because this is live. We, if we have time at the end, we'll try to add it on uh, to our sessions. 
Um, so we're supposed to record this in advance, but hey, due to Corona, we are all in lockdown, so no one is moving around. But luckily, we have the internet; we can do this live. Anyway, guys, so for today, today's today's guest is someone who I consider the future of entrepreneurship. She is young. She's ambitious. She's female, born right here on the continent, Rwanda to be exact. And she's solving a very big, huge problem that many Africans basically face. Uh, luckily, she's Rwanda, so she's solving this problem first in Rwanda. But during the interview, we're going to talk more about her future ambitions as well um, for the rest of Africa. So without further ado, guys, I would like to introduce to you the lovely Christelle Quisera. Christelle, I hope you can hear me. Yes, Theo, loud and clear. Oh. Yes, how are you doing on this lovely afternoon? I'm doing great. It's uh, it's giving signs of rain, so I'm pretty excited because like, rain is our friend, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys love rain, I guess. Uh, many of us are like, oh, rain, oh my God, we need to hide uh, somewhere, but I think <laughs> We shall we shall try to make this very concise and um, and uh, and concrete and hopefully it's going to be helpful to our lovely viewers who are watching all over the world. The first question I would like to ask: uh, What is it about your current life that surprises you the most? <laughs> um, I guess really what we've achieved with Water Access Rwanda. Um, every year it seems we reach one bigger milestone after the other. And mm -hmm. although I had a lot of plans and ambitions for the company, I'm still really surprised how much of that we've been able to achieve so far and to see the amazing team that is Water Access Rwanda that um, you know, I've put together, people have followed my vision. That, that always, always surprises me. <laughs> amazing. So, so, Christelle, if I'll be correct, you are right now the founder and the managing director of Water Access Rwanda which you founded yes. about in 2014. So that would make it that you were 20 at that time. Is that correct? Yes, I was uh, I was 20. So I, my birthday is always in December. Uh -huh. So I'm always about one year earlier. So I, I was still um, 20 when I founded the company. So what is it about water that kind of drew you to start an enterprise in that domain? Um, at first, when I was designing the project, it was uh, majorly about uh, creating a, a platform where we can create more jobs for young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of have this belief that the bigger the problem, the bigger the solution has to be as well. And it's something yeah. that feeds my work. Uh, it fed my work mm -hmm. back then. And I was looking at a place where we could sustainably employ young people as solution providers, uh, because at the time there was, uh, and there still is today, there's all this talk about uh, the time bomb that Africa has of young people mm -hmm. unemployed, growing unemployment with young people. And I was always uh, very concerned and committed to be a, a solution creator. And yes. basically when people are talking about young people being a problem, not finding employment and uh, all these other issues, uh, I was part of those young people, and I realized I was uh, in a better uh, position, a more privileged position, having gone to the U.S. for my degree, doing mechanical engineering on full scholarships. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a bigger network and bigger connections uh, than, I guess, most uh, young people in Rwanda. So I wanted to use that platform to create solutions. And for me, I, I realized the water sector was one sector that could uh, open up opportunity for employment. At the time, uh, as many Kigalians, I thought water scarcity really meant uh, outages, water outages, not having water in your tap and so on. But mm -hmm. as I traveled the world, I noticed that safe water out of your taps is something normal. I used to get surprised when I'll be in Kigali and at the end of the month, I'm looking at my spending and my biggest spending was on bottled water in restaurants. So, you know, you get used to always getting tap water, cheap water everywhere you go that, you know, you still order the water as a, yeah. uh, yeah. when you go to restaurants here, but water is the same price as the Fanta or something mm -hmm. like that. So at first, my, my view of the water crisis was pretty shallow. Um, and I had seen the water crisis as a child, uh, but then around nine years old, we moved to Kigali with my family. We had running water. 
And, you know, we had people who helped us fetch water whenever we had outages. So I didn't really register how bad the crisis still was in rural areas. And I, I looked at the data um, at the time when I was starting the company. It did look terrible, but it always, data is always numbers until you see the people behind those numbers. So when exactly. I came from my summer project, I suddenly I was meeting the people, you know, we had our project area uh, mm -hmm. that we were working in and all the villages I passed on my way to our target uh, village, they all faced the same issues. Yeah. And uh, so that's what, when I started realizing that, talking to mothers, children, um, community leaders, priests, everybody wanted a water solution. Everybody knew how bad how badly they needed water how badly water was needed for development and i yeah. just couldn't get over the fact that there weren't enough solution in the sector uh mm -hmm. and that years and years of foreign aid and different interventions had not really fixed the crisis the way i i, I thought i thought we were much more advanced than we were so when i saw that i couldn't look back uh, i registered a company and i'm like okay i'm gonna work on this longer yeah so the the thing that i found interesting about you the most is that you are Rwandan, you were born in Rwanda, and you are basically solving a local problem, a personal like problem that you, you see around yourself and around your, you know, with your neighbors. So going back into your youth, so when you were like a child, I know you studied mechanical engineering. Um, what is it that was so interesting about mechanical engineering uh, that you even, uh, you know, that you pursued it so far that you even got a scholarship to the US? Um, yeah, actually, my dream uh, in terms of engineering as a kid was to do aerospace engineering. I kind okay. of ended into mechanical as a, as a second option. But as soon as I was in mechanical, I couldn't see any differently. I was like, I love this. I mean, I have, I would say, um, a short attention span. I love to be exposed to ideals. And once I'm exposed to something, I will research it and learn it but I don't want to be learning it for four years straight. So mechanical engineering is one of those engineering disciplines where every month feels like a different word. You know, one, you're learning statics, next you're learning hydraulics, next you're learning material science, then you're on to chemistry, then so you do a lot. Um, every semester feels like you're tackling a different challenge in engineering. And so how, that was how, very interesting to me. Uh, and how, but, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Rocky, how's the mechanical engineering helping you in your business right now? Oh, majorly. Uh, I mean, uh, for the longest time, I was the head engineer of the company. So a lot of the technology we have, the training, I had to go out and train the team and do all the design work. So it's a lot of design, um, knowing which pump to put where, uh, knowing what structures to build to hold the tanks. And, you know, it's all a lot of engineering. But um, the biggest way in mechanical engineering is helping me right now. It's really being a pro problem solver uh, and having those analytic skills that you learn as an engineer. So it's about identifying a problem, knowing the tools you have and uh, working diligently towards a solution. Um, and we run a lot of pilots within Water Access Render. So that, that way of working, that way of thinking really always comes out uh, into our work. Yeah. So um now that you're an adult would you say you are more of a, an engineer than an entrepreneur or are you an entrepreneur who is an engineer <laughs> my god that's the that's the toughest question but um <laughs> i'd say I, i'm both it depends on the situation and mm -hmm. by the way mechanical engineering are probably the the people who are least faithful to their discipline. Uh, a lot of mechanicals end up in low degrees in sales management. Uh, not uh, very few pursue mechanical engineering in um, in, a, in a research fashion or up to PhDs and stuff. Um, so I would say I'm both. It depends on the situation. I'm I'm still an engineer. I love my engineering background. Uh, mm -hmm. I love the technical work that we do. I probably have more insights and more inspiration about my work when I visit the field than when I'm sitting in the office. But at the same time, uh, what the company needs uh, from me right now is my fundraising, my leadership ability, my uh, networking and all that, which 
Uh, yeah, still um, strong things within mechanical because you have to do something and then present it and design your projects, get funding for them. So yeah. I would say yeah, I'm still an engineer, but uh, my work now doesn't centralize on me being uh, a good engineer. It's more about leading a good team of engineers uh, in other mm. disciplines as well. So a lot of my technical work, I'm, I'm handing that over to other people while I focus more on um, more strategic and high level um, kind of tasks in day to days. Yeah, no, you're right about that. And I must say, at least in my experience so far, every company needs to have the technical know-how, knowledge to get started. And then after that, you have the knowledge to judge whether you know someone else is doing correctly. So let's go into mm -hmm. your business. So the year is 2014 and you are registering at the company. Let's say in your first year of operating, what was the biggest challenges that you faced in setting it up and making it grow to basically year two? Um, well, one of the first ones was we didn't have much runway. Uh, we didn't really start with a lot of investment. It was from customers. What mm -hmm. we had was trained people in machinery because we had in the previous summer, um, maybe I should have presided, but the company started from a summer project and then yeah. moved into a full business. So from the summer project, we inherited the tools, the people I trained. Uh, so that's all we had as a company. And I had to go to customers one by one uh, and convince them we could deliver the services they needed in terms of accessing water. And it was quite unusual. Uh, we were operating in a market where the biggest reason people chose to work with me was not our track record, but it was, they would ask, where did you get your degree? Uh, because there was still a lot of that skepticism around a Rwandan company run by Rwandans. Uh, mm -hmm. The market is changing right now, but when we started, there was a lot of that negative perception that comes with the local company. Uh, yeah. But of course, being a US grad, many people were quick to trust us. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was involved in everything. You know, we started hiring people slowly by slowly, but at the time it was me and technicians. So I was handling finance, I was handling marketing, I was handling everything um, except, you know, going to the field all the time, but I was still supervising the field uh, people. So um, did you ask how it's now or? Uh, well, I, I, just I forgot the rest No, no, I was really curious about that, that like first year of like setting it up. And how did you go about um, hiring, let's say, your first three to five uh, employees? Yeah, um, we always had a lot of applicants. Uh, we would launch a job and we get like 300 people apply. And yeah. for me, I'm a, I'm a picky person uh, <laughs> with, uh, with regards to how we hire. I was always committed to hiring young people. So we always advertise entry level position. It's only now, uh, I mean, in the late stages of the company that were even considering hiring uh, experienced people. At, at first it was always higher entry level, train. Yeah. Uh, so we were really looking to train people who have the right values, who love what we're doing as a company and who are gonna stick along for the long ride. Um, yeah. So how we went about that, I mean, we did online applications open and then I would see uh, the submissions people make uh, and uh, try to get insights from that. Uh, yeah. But uh, generally, my hiring process is very dynamic. We play games uh, with uh, with uh, potential candidates. They come, we play games, and I learn a lot about a person when they're playing a game. Um, <laughs> and uh, we try to get to know people. I'm, I'm known to take people out for lunch. Uh, I mean, except for COVID, but I will take people out to lunch to get to know them better if somebody is very promising, sharp, um, uh, and so on. And I've always uh, looked at people who have ambition. Um, mm -hmm. So people who would come in and really want to grow with the company or have ambitions beyond the company. Uh, yeah. So hiring was, I mean, it's a mixture of written games and then interviews. Um, and it was always followed by an internship period uh, mm -hmm. of three to six months where then we observe how they fit in with the rest of the team. Uh, but we always looked at values and then we knew we were always going to train uh, whoever we found interesting. And how is your firing skills? Uh, they've gotten better over time. I used to be extremely terrible at that. I would forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive mm -hmm. until I looked and the whole company was suffering from my lack of decision making. Um, 
I, I always believe in people. I always trust people um, on a first uh, time basis. I, I, I give them the benefit of the doubt every time. But after my fir the first person I fired, um, after mm -hmm. that one first, I noticed how the company was so much better the next day. I literally, I had let this person almost push me out of my own company because they were just terrible. They were terrible. Um, and I should have taken that decision much earlier. As soon as that person was out, everybody was happy. People were laughing in the office. Uh, <laughs> and it's not what I expected. I actually thought they would be like, oh, our MD is starting to fire people left and right. or what? You know, I had all these negative uh, perception about firing a person. And then suddenly I was like, you know what? When a person is a bad fit, fire them before you have too many interactions with them. Um, so with time, I've actually gotten really better. I've, um, I've learned to always uh, part with people on a good term basis because the more, sometimes you can be giving somebody a chance they don't deserve and that only destroys your relationship with that person. It doesn't improve their performance. Some people need a second chance, but once they've used that, that app and you're on the fourth, fifth chance, all you're doing is destroying um, uh, yours and that person's uh, relationship and their future, their future and your future as a company. So the firing skills have definitely gotten better. And it's a good thing. I used to think it's a negative thing, but it's <laughs> really a good thing. No, I think that's um, that's necessary, right? You cannot hire, hire, hire and never fire. But um, it's always interesting, I guess, that's when you see when the most entrepreneurs start to grow, when they learn how to fire people. Um, so uh, again, what is like interesting about your, your, your business? It's like a problem that you are solving is, is humongous. It's like big, you have enough work for the coming, I think, 50 to 100 years probably. Um, <laughs> and, and, and of course, it's also like internationally, like Africa and everywhere. So we're gonna talk about more about Africa and, the, and the, your future um, expansion. But now, how is your business right now? Right now we are in COVID, I know, but uh, COVID has become also some kind of like a teacher in, in, in some kind of way. People have learned things about themselves they don't know about their company. So my question to you is, yeah, what has this pandemic basically taught you about your current field of work or job that you did not know before? Um, yeah, so the pandemic in general has uh, taught us to be better with our supply chain management. It was the first mm -hmm. crisis I faced as an entrepreneur. It's the first uh, market-wide crisis I think I've seen in Rwanda. Uh, even as a kid, I never saw our economy suffered this much. It was There was always this hope of growth uh, happening. Yeah. And I mean, COVID stole that away from us. I feel like there is more sex skepticism about the future and there's a lot of unclarity. So it's no longer a game of like the best will win. It's, mm -hmm. it's a sector thing. No matter how good you are, if your sector just can work with COVID, you know, you're, you're gonna go under. No matter how good yeah. your marketing is, no matter how good your planning was, like it's it's, it's been that kind of crisis. Well, uh, but uh, luckily for us in the water sector, uh, it's it should actually be the opposite. Uh, we're suffering as a company because our customers are suffering, but in terms of market demand, it has actually increased. There's more need for water, for water products, for hygiene products. Uh, this is a sanitary um, it's a sanitary issue. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things we love about COVID, and I'm saying this with all the consideration of how it has wrecked our world, but it has some positives. Um, one, it's really taught us about massively, the whole population about protecting from transmittable diseases. Yeah. Uh, you know, we always, always spend so much time training people about washing hands, uh, uh, keeping social distance whenever they're in groups and things like that. But mm -hmm. now we see that non-communicable disease, like non, um, sorry, entities, neglected tropical diseases like uh, intestinal worms, it's going down because guess what? The same way we protect against COVID, that's how we protect from diarrhea and all these other waterborne diseases. So that's uh, a positive we shouldn't ignore about COVID. There is massive education about the habits we should have as people on sanitary and hygiene um, practices. Uh, yeah. It's taught us a lot about supply chain management, as I started saying. Uh, we were super unprepared uh, for any interruption in our model. Like we were, uh, we didn't really, although we had cash in terms of runway, we didn't have inventory or spare parts in our runway model. So mm -hmm. as soon as that hit, that was the first way we were affected because airports were closed. 
we couldn't get mm-hmm. stuff in. And for me, I think that's in basic when you're operating in a country like Rwanda, where some of your supply is based outside, you know, you're not manufacturing everything locally. So um, it's taught us a lot of lessons around that and we're planning better. Uh, we're planning now with always a plan B and a plan C and a plan <laughs> D in mind. We used to just be like, you know, we, whatever we go with, it happens and then we can deal with the issues as they happen. Mm-hmm. But that's no longer an option. Uh, so, but it really strengthened our values uh, in mm-hmm. terms of being committed to people and customers. It was yeah. always something we said, but it put it to the test and we came out correct because we we didn't uh, reduce the number of employees. We kept the taps running as much as we could. Uh, yeah. And we even get free water when we could. So really it helped us um, strengthen and live out our mission, not just with words, but with practical actions. Yeah, so your, your company now has been in the, it's been operating for um, seven years, I guess. It's year on, 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 on year seven. And you basically started by providing water by digging boreholes. And now you have, Four different projects, I would say. I think you call them, uh, let me see, I wrote them down. Inuma, Amazi, Uhira, Ijavo. Um, like how, basically, how profitable are these projects or are they mostly kind of like innovating, you know, planning for the future, trying something out or are they all big money makers? Uh, yes, so that's always a big question for look, uh, look at our company. Uh, the water sector is a very complex sector because everyone needs water. And yeah. everyone, I also mean every entity. So you have people, you have business, you have farms, you have everybody needs water. And it's a tough market to address because our mission is pretty broad in that regard. We want to provide safe water for drinking, but also uh, affordable water uh, for productive usage. So when you're trying to address a market like that, your your product profile sometimes is a little bit varied, uh, which ours is as well. So, but we've tried to bundle it up in four in four uh, different uh, categories. So, um, Uhira is our most tested, uh, and I would say most um, contributing to revenue right now. Yeah. Uh, it has a lot of potential for growth in the market because it's looking at the farm and off grid business market. Um, yeah. We have a lot of uh, happy clients, and the market demand is it's it's huge. Maybe, Only one point six percent of Rwanda of arable land is yeah. So re- real quick before because Say many what? of the, the the people watching probably don't know it, but maybe you can go through them what they mean and, and in short what they do. So if we start with uh, Uhira, it's I believe irrigation. Mm-hmm. So maybe in your words, what what, what does it do? So Uhira is an off-grid water source that, that pumps water from underground underground water sources and uh, distributes it for farm usage. So it's a system per farm. Uh, okay. And the farm can be for irrigation, for livestock, but it can also be good for off-grid businesses, like mm-hmm. uh, working in the meat processing industry or packaging industry. We've had clients uh, from those uh, varied um, uh, yeah. business types. Uh, and the- then what- Amazi... Uh, Sorry? The next one is, yeah, continue, sorry. Yes, so Amazi is focused on urban households and it was introduced last year in reaction to the increased floodings and Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that in the rain season we have the most outages in Kigali. Uh, We have a lot of rain in the country and we want to encourage people to harvest the rainwater. So Amazi in its MVP, so the minimum viable product, it's a home uh, water filtration unit that collects rainwater and filters the water so that throughout the house you have safe water to drink and in the rain season your water bill can be substantially reduced. Um, The long-term goal with Amazi is to be basically the first uh, version of a stormwater utility in Rwanda. We want to reward people who have this rainwater because at the end of the day, that water is not flooding our valleys. It's not destroying infrastructure as we have seen. And at the same time, um, you know, it's free water from the heavens and we want people to use it to love rainwater because there's nothing wrong with rainwater. Um, and Amazi is still growing. We, we've had customers for it, um, but they've kind of trickled in and out. But this year... Uh, this is probably exciting for your viewers, but we're offering a subsidy uh, in partnership with the Rwandan Water Board. I wish their Twitter mm-hmm. handle is actually Rwanda Water. <laughs> uh, people <laughs> may have noticed a little Twitter um, 
um, yeah. stick. But so the Rwanda Water Board um, has sponsored a project with Amazi where we're going to provide a subsidy to the first uh, 400 adopters in the Kigali city uh, mm -hmm. to be able to harvest rainwater and use it for their house. Um, now, uh, Inuma. Inuma is our most exciting, and that's where we're really pegging our growth uh, as a company moving forward because it addresses the core of the water crisis, which is people having access to water safely piped and affordable right into their homes. Um, mm -hmm. So Inuma is, is a water mini grid. Um, we pump water from the underground, we create uh, elevated storage, we filter that water before distributing it into individual homes. Uh, and the whole system uses prepaid meters so our customers can finally, for the first time, have affordable, reliable, safe water into their homes. We sell, although it's drinking water, you can drink the water if you want. We only sell it for one franc per liter. Uh, so a jerry can for 20 francs or a meter cube for a thousand. Um, and the reason we do that is we want the water to be cheap enough that people use it for everything. Wash with it, laundry with it, whatever. But it's safe enough that if you want to take a drink, you don't need to purify it any further. Yeah. So Inuma in that regard is really at the core of addressing the water crisis um, that we see the one that's making women walk uh, 200, uh, you lose 200 million hours a day working for water, uh, the one that's affecting still over 400 million Africans. Um, so that's the biggest uh, market that we're, uh, we're, we're undertaking right now. Uh, Ijabo, which we touched on, Ijabo is a new uh, product we're going to be piloting this year. Uh, it's basically in Numa, but for irrigation. It's going to be uh, an irrigation mini grid. And mm -hmm. we're trying it to um, offer a solution to people who live uphill. As you know, Rwanda has, uh, we have big mountains, and a lot of people on those big mountains have really fragmented land. They have small plots of land uh, that yeah. they're farming. It's not large. So for them to irrigate, they only really depend on rain. So we want to provide a solution to those people who live uphill so that mm -hmm. they can irrigate, grow high value uh, horticulture crops. And uh, through that support program, uh, we're going to also provide them quality uh, seeds and inputs and also connect them to a market so that they can go from harvesting 200,000 franc worth of stuff from their plots to upwards of 3 million from a small plot. Um, and that's going to be good business for us because uh, basically if they're growing higher value crops, they also need to meet higher standards, which include uh, irrigating. Um, so it's it's a uh, one thing I really love about our solution is we gain. We gain. We're still a business. We're not doing this as a charity, but yeah. we're achieving the goals charities are trying to achieve while at the same time making money and creating market viable solutions. So mm -hmm. it's it's what we call a triple bottom line where we get a bottom line in terms of profit and we get a bottom line on impact, positive impact on people and the planet. Yeah, okay, that's a good segue maybe to talk about indeed uh, money because like you said, uh, this is not a charity, it is, um, it is an, uh, an, a for-profit business, but I do know that you, uh, you specifically chose this to be a social entrepreneurship where you're basically making a difference and um, making money um you have you are you are very popular on the internet right now because you've won numerous prizes um that we'll talk about in a minute uh, but before you were there i know you started first with a, doing a, a project for school how was it in general in your first few years the acquisition of money you know, people when, when they want to start a business they are usually their bottleneck is money how did you deal with that um, yeah, we remember we're from this market, so there is not like we didn't do the typical follow a plan, like do a market research and then start offering a product. I kind of already had an intuition on who is going to be our customers and who can pay for our services. So uh, farmers were always the first on the line, and that's why up to now Uhira is a pretty big driver for revenue. Uh, but it's not as resilient to <laughs> things like COVID, for example. Inuma is much more resilient. Um, yeah. But uh, we we would approach farmers and we offer our services for 60% upfront, and we offer the service, and then we they pay us 40% at the end of the service, and they have a full irrigation system to work with. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of revenue, I think 2015 we didn't make 
um, I think we made a small loss, maybe like uh, $1,000 or something. Yeah. Second year, we were profitable. Third year, we were profitable. We actually started being unprofitable last year, <laughs> which no, is really? COVID, but also we're investing heavily in infrastructure. So we're investing heavily uh, in people and uh, infrastructure for Inuma, which oh, Inuma has a longer, um, Inuma breaks even uh, between um, two and four years. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a longer game, right? We're going to see the output later when we reach massive scale. But right now it's it's kind of a money loser for the company if you compare it with other products. Uh, but it has yeah. the most impact. It has the absolutely most impact. Um, so we, um, by the end of 2019, we, we'd made uh, $350,000 in revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of trickled down to around uh, 80 something dollars in net profits. Uh, yeah. Once you've considered everything. Uh, and then, uh, of course, last year, we, we lost probably all our profits from the year before. <laughs> yeah, I think the whole world has, uh, has lost something last year. Um, but so I, I believe in this world, there are two kind of money problems. There is like uh, not enough money and there's too much money. And you recently won, I think, the Cisco Prize Award, which is like a quarter million dollars. And you also won uh, one from Jack Ma, which is like around $100,000. So this is some serious money, uh, Chris. How uh, are you going to be, how is this money going to basically help your business? Yeah. Uh, actually, so those are the two big uh, ring leaders in terms of prizes won. But we've, uh, as a total money coming into the company from last year to this year, it's going to be, around $720,000, so it's it's quite a big sum. Uh, and for us, um, the main way to uh, we're going to use that, because it's a lot of cash, right? Yes. So when you're talking money, you have to kind of make a difference between uh, profit and cash. So right now we have a lot of cash in the company, which uh, that cash needs to be put to good use uh, so that it can turn a profit. Uh, yeah. We're, um, first of all, investing in people. Uh, we're hiring uh, over 18 new positions. I'm excited and also really extremely scared. Uh, yeah. But I think overall it's going to turn out well. Um, and we're hiring a lot of people. We're buying a lot of new machinery. But uh, we're also investing in a lot of new Inuma water points uh, and running our pilot for uh, Ijabo and continuing to do market entry for Amazi. So there is still... Um, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, you said we're going to talk about our 12 year plan, but all of this money coming in, it's it's almost a uh, tiny compared to what we will need uh, next year, because <laughs> next year we're going to need uh, triple or four times that uh, to meet our goals and targets uh, yeah. because we're trying to be in 12 countries by 2030 and be impacting almost 30 million people's lives uh, with our different solutions. So. Yes, uh, now with the cash we have, uh, except the different investments we need to make, we're also financing our clients on a massive scale. That's something yeah. we started doing last year. Uh, most of our products are financed at 0% uh, for our different customers so that people can enjoy the benefits before they, they break bank. So if you yeah. need a irrigation project, you can already come, we service you, and then you pay us on a monthly basis instead of uh, uh, coming up with the cash uh, every, uh, all at the... Uh, at the onset of the project yeah yeah so your, yeah your business has basically like really taken off in a way i think from now on it's just going to be uh, compounding uh, in a way how do you personally stay sane and focused on the mission that is ahead with all this massive cash flow that's hanging around COVID, employees and you know maybe your own personal time and uh, relaxation uh, that's not something I can give good advice on because I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm terrible. You ask me how I'm doing, I tell you how the company is doing. And that's uh, that's a challenge of being a founder. You, you, you associate so much your well-being to your company's well-being that it can become yeah. uh, quite tough. Um, I've been known to stress a lot and um, burn out, but it's something that's... Um, um, that, that, that that's to be expected when you're running something that's first of all not usual but also uh, quite demanding uh you're always casting this vision and so on yeah. so uh, i wouldn't say i'm the right person to give that advice but um 
I've heard from the best, uh, Jack Ma, we, I, I, we asked him how he avoids burnout and he's like, I burn out every day, but I'm <laughs> back at it the very next morning. <laughs> um, and for me, uh, what really keeps me giving and giving and giving, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's because I receive so much back when I see the impact we're having. It's, um, yeah. The impact is not really like, I'm not in this for my own personal benefits. I'm trying to create as much shared value as we can with the community. And yeah. when you see their lives completely transformed from our staff to the people we service, uh, I feel humbled uh, to have been an enabler of that uh, in the way we were. Like it's, it's still, um, it's not something you get used to, you know, when you meet a person and they tell you how their lives are completely transformed. One of our employees quit his quit the job with us because he saved up enough money to buy a plan and start his own business. Like yeah. those are those things you're like, okay, but you were a good employee. But at the same time, I'm so excited you were able to do that. And yeah. so the fact that we're you know creating all this impact for me is something that keeps me giving. And um, I've always um, I have an autoimmune illness, so it's always been like living with a time clock in a way because um, I was exposed to my own uh, mortality quite early in my career, around when I was 17 years old. So what kind of illness you have? Old, I, did, I did not hear it correctly. It's an autoimmune. It's called pemphigus vulgaris. It's pretty rare. Okay. Uh, and in the process of getting diagnosed, I really was almost dying. And it's wow. kind of put a... It, by exposing me to my own mortality, it's made me realize how little time we have uh, yeah. on earth to make an impact. So that's why if you're trying to have a balanced life, don't listen to me. <laughs> uh, if you're trying to make a lot of impact in the little time we have, you know, listen to yeah. me. But no, uh, definitely a person needs a balance. <laughs> No, no, and I think uh, about the impact indeed. I think for the maybe for the viewers who are watching, maybe who have, who have never been to Africa, who have never been to Rwanda, and have never seen abject poverty and shortcomings that are actually in the other part of the world, um, your 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 business really has an impact. It's really changing life on such a massive scale. It's even hard for me to say it in words, and I think even if I film it, it will not say enough. So. You are hitting it on the right spot and it's coming from the uh, right person. And I guess every time when I ask top entrepreneurs like you who are doing something massive, like what motivates you, what drives you, usually there's something big in, in your case, maybe in, indeed exposure to mortality. You kind of like, you get slapped out of like uh, maybe laziness or whatever. You just go go after it. And uh, yeah, hopefully, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll need to talk about your balance because I'm a, I'm a trainer and I, my, my, my world is helping <laughs> people physically and mentally. So we'll talk about that um, on, uh, on, uh, on some other time. Um, and, and lastly, just about your company because it's, it's maturing right now. I see you have also, uh, yeah, board members, I would say, from, I think one is your, your teacher from, from Oklahoma uh, to someone who is um, in, in a, close to the presidency or in, in the government. Uh, are, are board members, because I don't have board members in, in, in kind of business that I do, do they serve as some kind of um, teachers for you? Do they help guide you in, in certain ways or are they more people who are there for the right connections and um, to basically to, to, to help you see things that you're not seeing? Mm -hmm. um, board members are probably super, super important. Um, one of the biggest advantages I think we have other over other companies founded in Rwanda around the same time we did was we started with board members. We've never been as a company without that board oversight and leadership. Uh, and first of all, it keeps you accountable as a founder. Um, yeah. I remember I had a vetting schedule for even my shares in, in the business. Although it's my business, I had a vetting schedule and it was the board to <laughs> to do that. So it's something that I was like, okay, I want to be committed to this to help me. So in that essence, they're accountability partners for you. You, you They, they yeah. share your vision and they help you achieve it. Uh, the other yeah. thing, it's connections. Um, you say uh, Dr. Mike O'Neill, he was the former president of my university. Honestly, I started this company because of him. Uh, if I hadn't met him, if I hadn't been challenged by him, I wouldn't even have started uh, Water Access Random. Uh, but beyond him being at the start, he was always there at our, in our early growth. 
Like mm -hmm. uh, he was on the presidential advisory council. And one time he's like, Christa, I have a meeting with the president. Can you put up a proposal that I can give to him? And that's the kind of caliber of people that you need when you're starting the business. Somebody who's so proud of you, uh, even in your infancy. Like for me, we were presenting budgets of like $50,000 a year. And imagine yeah. putting that in front of the president. Like when I think about it, I'm like, ah. Oh. But this person <laughs> believed in us so much that he was like, yeah, I'll give him the proposal. Um, and yeah. uh, now uh, he's unfortunately retired. So he was replaced by an equally brilliant lady called uh, Ga Gaia, Gaia Tridator. She's running her own social enterprise in Rwanda and mm -hmm. uh, a superstar um, uh, within the ecosystem here, social enterprise. Um, and if you see the other board members, they're all people who were with the company uh, in its beginnings, uh, but also mm -hmm. contributed heavily in one way or another. So we have committees, we have skills assessment for the board. So every board member brings a skill, whether it's finance, legal, um, things that you, things you don't even know you need. But yeah. if you structure your board collect correctly, these are people who can not only give you the advice or the connections, but guide you and even jump in to do works. Like the biggest contracts we ever signed, uh, we were able to negotiate a 10 year contract uh, back in 2017. And if it wasn't for all our board members jumping redlining that contract, you could have been trapped in something terrible. But they all yeah. offered their help. So our board members are super important. Don't get them just for the connections. Uh, get yeah. them for their skills, their exposure, what they bring that you don't have. And most importantly, get them for leadership, for their accountability of you as a mm -hmm. founder, because you do need that. You need somebody who checks you and balances you so that you're not off doing something on a whim that may actually make the company lose money or lose its focus and impact. Okay. Well, it's good to hear that at least it did not, uh, you know, slow you down because sometimes that's like the other story you sometimes hear from um, from uh, board members. Um, so lastly, um, as we are heading towards the end of this um, uh, interview, uh, real quick, one of the other, of course, major accomplishments that you are doing, you're not only young, you're also like female running such a big company. Luckily, Rwanda is one of those countries, they say it's more female friendly. Uh, you been doing your business and, and, and leading such a big group. Um, do you feel, do you agree with that? Is Rwanda more female for, uh, country? And um, have you had any kind of like obstacles that you felt are gen gender specific towards you? Yes, um, Rwanda is super female friendly and I've seen it as soon as I went to university in the US because <laughs> I went from being a normal person in a classroom to one of the few females in the class yeah. and that was the first uh, it was strange um yeah. and it was always uh, i wasn't just an engineer i felt like i always had that label of female engineer uh, okay. wherever i went uh, which I don't feel like in a surfer when you're in rwanda uh, mm -hmm. but definitely uh sometimes you celebrate too early i think rwanda is super friendly in many terms, you see uh, women in Rwanda are more empowered. We have a lot of freedom. I think I was reading the other day that uh, the women own more plots in Kigali uh, than men, uh, which there's very few cities that can claim something like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, countrywide, it's not really the case. Uh, and uh, there's, still, um, there's still many women are not. And mm -hmm. you slowly get that exposure when you're added to a forum or a meeting and you mm -hmm. find that you're the only person there. So, and then you see, okay, before I came on board, this meeting for the past <laughs> hundreds of years have been happening without a woman in the room. So there's still so many rooms where there is no women. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, this reflects in decisions that are made. Uh, because we all live with some intrinsic biases. And the fact that we don't have enough to change that bias, uh, it, it's, um, uh, it reinforces uh, some of our stereotypes. And that mm -hmm. comes out, especially uh, with partnership building and fundraising. Uh, you're mm -hmm. often like, I feel sometimes we're tokenized uh, by some people rather than really supported. Uh, and some people, People may work with you not because you're a good company, but because you're a female-led company or a company led by a young person. 
And it's mm. something I often speak about. I'm not ashamed to take money if I'm getting it because I'm young and female and running this company. But as soon as I have that money, I'm going to challenge <laughs> the reason <laughs> to be yeah. appreciated for what the company is doing, not necessarily uh, given that uh, as a young female and so on. But at the same yeah. time, um, I have this burden as uh, because we're always a pioneer. We're the first runner to do that, the first woman to do that, the first young person to do this. Um, mm -hmm. so there's a challenge that comes with that. There's a challenge to be successful and people what they've been missing out on by not recognizing more black female young fund founders. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you're exposed to how terrible everything is. Um, mm -hmm. I was reading some research that uh, in I think it's but in the history of them tracking companies raising money, only nine or a female entrepreneurs had ever raised above uh, one million dollars. So that means oh, if you wow. open a business today as a black woman and you raise a million dollars, uh, like just think about 90, 90 people. And mm -hmm. that number actually doubled uh, last year because the year before it was <laughs> way less. Um, and it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's something we need to celebrate. I feel like we need so much more. Um, in that scale, I think San Fran in San Francisco in the Bay Area, 1,400 companies raised over $1 million. So compare that with the fact that only 90 female black female founders mm -hmm. have raised the same amount of money in the history of tracking that. And so it's terrible. And uh, people talk about it. We say it. We like more money to women, uh, more women in the supply chains. But the truth is it's not happening. It's not happening quickly enough. And what means on the level of a black female founder is you're facing bias you don't even see. And for the longest time, I just really believed what uh, feedback I got, that I wasn't good enough, I was risky, investment, all of these things. But every investment is risky. Every business comes with yeah. But the only difference is I don't look like a person they can take a chance on. I don't look like a next Steve Jobs or a next Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like they really have yeah. to bend their bias and perception to see uh, a female founder, somebody who can do something huge. Uh, and for mm -hmm. me, it's a, it's a challenge to see people invest in lesser businesses when we're mm -hmm. out here with, you know, four years of audited statements, uh, very clear path to, to scale, very clear the years, very clear impact and all bunch of benefits at their investment. And I'm not pointing the door at everybody. There are some really great investors who invest in us and pull in others because they acknowledge the bias, but we need to do more. We need to question their bias and, mm. uh, with in mind that they, they, they need to question their data and really ask themselves, why are they not? Are female founders founding bad companies? Are we not really bad at business? Oh, oh no, we're not. <laughs> like women run the informal economy. But once we get yeah. into the formal work where there is these wells that make decisions over everything, suddenly you can find women. Uh, but when yeah. it's us making the decision, working with the market, uh, we're extremely successful. Yeah. No, I think I think more women should definitely, definitely more women like you should um, should and probably will come um, out, of, um, out of this. So um, I know we spoke uh, before uh, about the future privately, and, but in, in short, what is, how is the, future of uh, water access um, Rwanda uh, looking like uh, in the coming five years? Yes, we actually like, <clears throat> we like to look at the 10 year plan, uh, but the next two years we're doing our transition to scale. So this year and next year, uh, next year we're gonna build a pretty huge facility that's going to cut our cost, get us ready for scale. I want to move from being able to do four systems a month to about 100. So it's gonna be a huge jump. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, we'll be uh, expanding at a much quicker pace. Uh, it's something that I'm excited to lead the company through, but it's quite scary because we're gonna be growing 5X and more uh, in the following years. Um, and um, in that regard, once we have the facility, once we have, um, all that traction to expand quickly uh, is to start working with development partners, development banks uh, to take concessions in different countries. So throughout mm -hmm. this year, we're gonna expand a lot in Rwanda uh, as well as next year. We wanna do a few, you know, a few models uh, in neighboring countries like the DRC, 
uh, mm -hmm. but we're also looking strongly uh, at being in 12 countries. So once we, we have the facility going and we can accept uh, much larger financing, which uh, the way the world works, uh, the more money you're asking, the less expensive that money is. Uh, <laughs> so that's why we want to kind of grow our scale and then uh, drive in bigger money for quicker expansion. Uh, but yeah, we are transitioning to scale. We're growing our people this year, growing our capacity. Uh, next year, we grow the facility, the production uh, to improve quality control at scale. And then, um, yeah, we will start growing country to country, country to country. Uh, and we yeah. want to be in 12 countries uh, by 2030. Uh, and that means we're going to be in countries that have pretty huge rural areas, countries where government uh, doesn't really have the strength uh, and sometimes the will to increase infrastructure in the rural areas. Uh, so we're, we're especially countries hitting from war as well. I want yeah. to go in uh, because many countries are still being given pumps. We want to be the people who come in and uh, improve that to pipe water. All right, interesting. Uh, looking forward to following you foot by foot for this uh, journey. Um, final question for the little small, you know, Christelle Quizera ladies who are young right now, but they aspire to achieve something that you have achieved, also start a business, make a difference. Uh, what advice would you give them um, in, in basically to, in, for them to, to focus on or to start? Yeah, uh, one is just start. <laughs> don't <laughs> don't think too much about it. Uh, the best um, the best learning, the best uh, problem solving comes as you go through the process. Uh, it doesn't yeah. matter how good your plans are. You probably gonna throw them out the window on your first day. So just go in, start, learn, um, forgive yourself. Uh, it's something I tell people often. Uh, be vulnerable, be vulnerable, accept your own weaknesses, learn from them, and then forgive yourself and get better. Uh, go out there and be better. But at the same mm. time, uh, believe uh, in your own capacity. Uh, especially women, like we have this imposter syndrome and then we doubt ourselves and then we think our accomplishments are not really us. It's something we all face, but uh, my advice is learn about those things so that you can recognize them when they happen. Uh, get yeah. a mentor where possible so they can help you stay focused when such things happen. Um, mm -hmm. But really, my biggest advice is get started. Get started and uh, surround yourself with the right people. Don't let uh, people take advantage of you. Uh, don't let um, anything stop you in your journey. Uh, but if it happens, forgive yourself, move on. You can make mistakes. Uh, we all make mistakes. I've made some mistakes where I went home and didn't feel like I can go back to work. You know, but I woke up and went to work and uh, the company yeah. has grown outside of that mistake. So things like yeah. that happen running a business is more, you know, people tend to see me winning awards out there. And, you know, I wish they also saw me messing up uh, because that's not an image you want to say, but it happens. I mess up. I do terrible mistakes, but the only difference yeah. is I wake up from those mistakes. I don't let it hold me back. I, I still wake up and, you know, Correct it, uh, learn better, um, accept advice, research, and uh, learn. But I would mm -hmm. say really my advice is start. Start something. Don't wait for permission from anybody. Give yourself permission to go out and try and accept that failure is just a part of the journey. Yeah. Okay. That is definitely powerful advice. I think a great way to segue to the end of this um, interview. Christo, thank you very much. Your story is truly inspiring, but the work that you're doing is even more inspiring, um, uh, uh, I would say. And it's it's really amazing the time that we're living in, of course, to kind of like follow everything that we're doing um, uh, online. I know that you are also, like you said, you are uh, hiring multiple positions. So shall we like post a, a link of the positions that are still available beneath the, this video? If uh, the people are watching are interested in looking for a job, I know many people uh, who are watching with the one to come to Rwanda and to either start a business or work, I would definitely suggest working with Chris here because the mission she's on is definitely one that's it's, it's, it's bigger than her. It's really, it's only the beginning. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Here. This was lovely. Uh, thank you for sharing with us. Uh, I'll put all of the links of thank Chris you. also in the comment section below if you want to contact her. To my lovely people watching, Murakose Chane, thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe, of course, and I'd like to see you all in the next video. Mamuche.